So we're in the middle of a sermon series called Simplified. And um, the tagline here is really just the gist of why I'm in this series, and it's simply this, to demystify words in the Bible or theological terms, okay? So there are words in the Bible that sometimes we read and we'll gloss over because we don't truly understand them. So I'm trying to... uh, trying to demystify those words, and then theological terms that we talk about that I would like to make more sense and just to be more simple. And here's what I know about words. Words come and go in our culture. Um, I think about a word like YOLO that we talked about last week, right? That word has already come and gone, right? Um, And not only do words come and go, but words actually change and evolve in meaning over time. Now, the Bible means what it means, but we can use words to say what it means uh, throughout different decades, right? And so I think about uh, the fact that words that meant something uh, bef- in the past now have different meanings. And so it's very important that we know what the Bible is saying. Not just the word, but what does that mean? Um, Let me give you an example. If Michelle bought a brand new, beautiful dress and she came out and said, well, how do I look? And I said, well, you look awesome. You look tremendous. You look terrific. If I said those words, I don't think that she she would find that uh, offensive at all. She would probably, you know, think that that's a compliment. But, But awesome started out as uh, the definition is causing great fear. Awesome. Uh, Tremendous, if you can see there, the the root is trembling with fear. And the last one there uh, is terror inducing. You can see the first, you know, the first root of the words is terrific, right? And so uh, hopefully she would find those. And if you could turn this down a little bit because it's got a little ring to it. So I don't think she would find that offensive, but words evolve in meaning over time. And uh, just like the word love in the English language, the word we're going to talk about today in the Bible, uh, fear, is broad, like it it depends on the context. Um, And and the only thing I can liken it to that I can explain to you in, in our current culture is this word love where we talk about how we love our kids, but then if you say making love, that's not the same thing, right? The word is broad depending on the context. Um, just this past week, our youngest daughter, Reagan, uh, she said, Dad, I love you, and your heart melts, right? Now, she was eating a bag of Cheetos when she said that, and in the next breath, she said, I love Cheetos. <laughs> Now, I don't know if that uh, elevated how much she really loves Cheetos or depreciated how much she really loves me, but this word fear in the original language that the New Testament is written in is similar to how we have this word love. It matters based on the context. So how we view this word fear when you read in your Bible is based on the context of the word. And this word fear comes from this original word here is phobos or phobos, however you want to say it. But you can see right away where we get the word phobia from, right? And here's the thing about this word phobia is um, it always has a negative context, right? You, you, when, when we use this word phobia, there's never anything positive. Like you, you, don't, you don't go up to someone and say, I, I've been diagnosed with 17 phobias. You know, Wow, I only have 13. See, it's not a positive word. It's always a negative. But this word phobos isn't always negative, okay? So we need to understand that. So the context matter matters when you read this particular word in your Bible reading in the New Testament. Uh, and so it, it matters immensely. Let me give you another story. Um, one of our children, uh, whom Michelle and I love dearly, their room was starting to look really shabby, really shabby. And I said, I said, we got to get rid of some of this uh, trash in here, you know? And I must have triggered something. When I said, you know, we got to get rid of some of this trash because their reply to me was, don't call my junk trash. (laughs) Um, Okay, 
can we talk about getting rid of some of this junk, as you call it, you know? Now, she was using junk in an entirely different context than I would use junk. When I think of junk, you take it to the junkyard and you scrap it, right? But she was thinking junk as in mementos, keepsakes, right? All of those things. And so I, I actually need to let it slip by saying she, so you'll have to, f I have three daughters, so uh, I tried not to incriminate anybody, but um, I failed in that instance. We'll just say it's Reagan, so she won't uh... Okay, so our child was using this word junk in a positive context. And so this is a Bible tip for all of you, all of us, okay? Be careful not to lump everything in under this same word. Like if you're looking up a word, you, you have to use the context and especially the word fear. Why is that? Why do you have to be careful about this, this word fear? Because some verses tell us to fear and some verses tell us not to fear, yeah. right? And so that tells you that there is good fear and bad fear. And it is not a different word in the original language. It's the same word, phobos, okay, or phobos. It's based on the context. So let's talk about good fear. Good fear is to be encouraged. You know, when you have a small child, you want them to fear touching a hot stove right? And as they get older and accountable to God, you want them to fear the wrath of God if they've done something wrong, because that leads to repentance. And if you are a hypocrite and you're not living your life as you claim to be in Christ, there should be a level of fear that you have about that. So not all fear is the same, and not all fear is sin. In fact, we, let's just lo look at a rundown here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1, 7, and 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is pure, Psalm 19, 9. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, Proverbs 15, 33. To fear the Lord, that is wisdom, Job 28, 28. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, Proverbs 14, 27. Through the fear of the Lord Evil is avoided, Proverbs 16, 6. And 2 Corinthians 5, 11, since Paul's talking to people who knew this, he said, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. So what does it mean to fear the Lord or fear of the Lord? See, this phrase, I guarantee you, is a phrase that our culture does not understand. When they hear fear of the Lord, they think, oh, you, you want everyone to be terrified of your God? You know, wrath, doom, judgment, gloom. But that's not what it means. See, what this phrase means, because you look at the context of this word, is humble adoration and reverence and awe and respect for the creator of the universe who created your life. Amen? Let me give you an example. Married men, if you're in here, say, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I said married men, if you're in here, say, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, there we go. So married men, let me, let me give you an example of this type of fear. I do not fear my wife. <laughs> okay? I do not fear her, okay? I'm not, I don't have a loaded gun under my pillow in case she tries to smother me at night, okay? And I hope the same, right? For Okay, just making sure. All right, uh, so I don't fear my wife, but I do fear letting her down. And I do fear disappointing her. And I would shudder to even think about cheating on her. That would be a different kind of fear. Then I would fear my wife, I can guarantee you that. But there is, a, there is a fear that I have, and it's not a terrified fear, but it's a, a reverence and a respect for the relationship that we have, that I don't want to jeopardize that or ruin that, okay? Likewise, our relationship with God, okay, I don't, I'm not terrified of God, but I definitely am uh, afraid of letting God down. I'm definitely, I fear disappointing God, and there's always temptations where I fear cheating on God. There's so many things out there, 
And so that is the fear of the Lord which keeps me from all of these things, keeps you from evil, gives you wisdom. So that's when we talk about good fear. That's what we're talking about. And so the other type of fear would be bad fear, okay? And this type of fear is to be overcome. And so I want to clear up a little bit of fog in our Bible reading because the King James translation, there's nothing wrong with it, but they chose to translate a certain word into fear. And uh, it, it, at the culmination of all things, when God sends away the wicked, right, and they go to judgment and we uh, get everlasting life, there is a list of people who are sent away to judgment, you know, sexually immoral. The list goes on and on, right? But at the beginning of the list in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, in your King James Bible, it says, but the fearful, you know, sexually immoral, liars, all these things, they will, they will go, they will be sent away to judgment. Now, um, this word from the King James Version is not phobos. It's not that word, okay? And in fact, if you are a, a, have your Bible with you, if you look up Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, more than likely, it has been translated cowardly, okay? which most translations translate it to cowardly, not fearful, okay? And so it, it, uh, it's, a, it's actually a more negative word in there. And most translations now translate it cowardly. Now that's important because when your friend is afraid, you know, well, you better not be afraid. Revelation 21.8 says you're going to hell because you're afraid. See, the, this word in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, it appears again, this word, not phobos, but this other word in 2 Timothy 1, 7, when it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, or you could put cowardice. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but one of love and power and a sound mind. So for you mature believers who've been serving the Lord for many years and and, and you, you know a lot of things about the Bible, or you grew up reading King James, I think that it's vital that you don't scare new believers about fear. Don't scare them. Because not all fear is sin, okay? And not all fear is bad, okay? And if that's the case, then I would like for you to explain to me this verse that the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and there's an underlying word that we'll all say together. He says this, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. There's that word phobos right there, okay? Would anyone tell me that Paul is a coward heading to eternal judgment? I don't think you would, right? Okay, so I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but sometimes I play one behind the pulpit. And so uh, I love, I wrote this down because this, this would sound funny if someone ever cut this portion and just put it out there. But it, in no way will I tell you that what I'm about to describe to you is even remotely scientifically accurate. <laughs> so that's, a, that's quite the disclaimer, right? But, I, but here's what I know. We all have to view this world and try to process what's going on around us and try to understand as much as possible. That's the goal in life, right? And so I'm going to use a 25-cent word here, even though the sermon series is called Simplified. This is a word I only use once, but we use something called phenomenological language to describe something in order for us to understand it better. Okay, and we use this language whether it accurately describes what is happening or not. And let me give you an example with that. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is a scientific organization in the, within the government that is run by the smartest scientists out there, right? Now, you can go to their website, and you can punch in your latitude and longitude coordinates, and then you can pick any day of the year. So you can punch anywhere in the world in, and any day of the year, and it will tell you precisely what time the sun will rise and what time the sun will set. But the truth is, 
The sun never rises. And the sun never sets, does it? Okay, but that's not the way we experience it, is it? Okay, so there's my disclaimer because I'm going to show you my, my chart I made here. This is my, my fear gauge, okay? And I, I liken fear like an RPM meter on an on a engine. Now, here's what I know. An engine requires fire. There's tiny little explosions that happen, whether you realize it or not. There's tons of them happening that makes the pistons go up and down, that makes your car run and move about in this world, right? Tiny little uh, explosions that create fire, and fire creates a, level, a certain level of heat, right? Now, in our life, in order to move around in our life, you're going to have a certain level of heat. And I would describe that as stress. There are things that happen, not internally, but outside things that stress you out. And just so you know, stress, external things that happen to us, is not fear. Stress is things that happen to us that is not fear. Just like temptation is not sin, stress is not fear. External things that are happening to us is not fear. There are going to be stresses in your life. Oh, I need to get new tires on my car soon, hopefully before winter. You know, oh, it's going to be 800 bucks. Oh, the shingles on my roof are starting to curl. I hope they last one more winter, right? Or my cholesterol is not what it's supposed to be. I got to work on that. Or I don't like who my daughter is dating. These are stresses in our life, right? And there's always going to be stress in your life. Jesus told us in John 16, I call it the three T's. He says, in this world, you will have trouble, or the other versions say trials, and some versions say tribulations, right? The three T's there. In this world, you'll have trouble, depending on the version of the Bible you read, John 16, So you are always going to have stress, trouble, pressures, trials, headaches. Those are tiny little things that generate heat in your life if you're moving around in this world, okay? But here's what I know. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, this word afraid is the same type of a root word from 2 Timothy chapter 1, that cower. Don't let your hearts cower, okay? Now, I want you to think about this fact, okay? Here is Jesus speaking in John chapter 14, and uh, he knows that his time is short, yet he's offering peace like no one else in this world can offer, like nothing else in this world can give you. And here he is knowing that, um, knowing that his time is, is short in knowing not just that it's short, but knowing how he's going to die. He knew that. And yet here is, here is someone that says, you can have peace. This was probably the most stress-filled time in his walk on this earth. I mean, the, everything was culminating at this point, and this is what he promised to his disciples to try and encourage them and, and cheer them up because they saw things happening. So, if you're tired of being afraid and tired of living in fear, know this, peace is not an absence of stress or problems in your life, but it's a knowledge of the presence of the one who can overcome them, okay? Peace is not an absence of problems or stress in your life, but a knowledge of the one who can overcome them. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalm 23, 4. It doesn't say, I will fear no evil, for he eliminates my stress and problems, and all my headaches go away. I think about the, the Cold War, like with Russia and the United States. Um, this lasted about, give or take, 45 years, and it didn't end until around 1991, right? Now, during that time, uh, there was... There was no official war between Russia and the United States, right? But, but was it peaceful? I don't think so. My high school in the 90s, when you go downstairs, there were these nuclear fallout signs 
okay? Uh, that, and, and, and some of you older than me can remember uh, uh, fallout drills. Now, that'll take the snowflake right out of this generation if we go, go to nuclear fallout drills, not just fire drills, right? But um, th- this is a time for 45 years that we didn't have war. It was an absence of war, but it did not mean that it was a time of peace, okay? And so peace isn't an absence of stress or problems. And so if you're searching for an absence of stress on this planet, I can't help you. I can't help you. I don't know where you can go. You know, if, you, if your job is stressful, I could tell you, well, you need to quit your job. And if working is stressful, then you have different stresses now because how are you supposed to pay your bills? You're just trading one set of stress for a different set of stress. It, there's no place in this world I'm going to tell you to go. I knew a couple that said they were done with all the stressful living of Michigan, and they moved down to Florida, and that summer was an unbelievable hurricane, and they moved right back up the next year. It, there's no place you're going to go to be absent of stress, none. I can't tell you how to be genetically unrelated to your family members. It's not possible, right? These are not promises that God has given us, Psalm 23, 4. That's not a promise that God has given us to be absent of those stresses. His promise is that he's with you. He's promised that he's with you. I think about this, without the benefit of modern science or any advances in technology, Paul writes almost 2,000 years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He writes this to the church in Rome. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Another translation says, do, you know, but be transformed by changing the way you think, if you might have that translation. Now, Paul wrote that almost 2,000 years ago without any uh, you know, medical technology or scientific advances, but he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we now know that this is called neuroplasticity. That's another big word, and it's the last time I'll use it. But all it really means is that your mind has the ability to change the way it processes things and to change the way it can think about stuff. And again, this is not a scientifically accurate description that I'm about to tell you, but I want you to imagine that your mind is like a muscle that can be exercised to do things that you weren't able to do before. Just like if I showed up across the street at Planet Fitness today, um, I wouldn't be able to lift if uh, what I could lift in a year from now if I went every day, right? Because I could exercise the ability to do something that I didn't have the ability to do before that. And the same is true with how you think. And people have known this for generations, but now there's scientific evidence to back up Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And and if you got saved in the church, maybe you don't know this, but if you didn't and you got saved later in life or you know someone who did, there are people that I know the F-bomb was their favorite adjective. I mean, they used it even for nouns, adverbs. It was the fill in the blank for anything that they couldn't figure out to accurately describe. And God changed the way they thought and and transformed them from the inside out. And you can change the way you think, not just what you think about, like, oh, I'm not supposed to be thinking about that, but how you think your thought process can be changed. And so when I look at this chart here, you have, you know, stress, which isn't. Uh, sin, stress that's in your life, that's not sin. But when you l- allow it to go into an area that becomes sinful, uh, that's a problem. So I'm pretty logical, I would like to think. My wife might say no. She's kind of going like this. But anyway, I like to fancy myself as logical. How about that? Is that more? Okay. So I, I'm fairly logical, and what I do This is no lie, because I I just want to share with you from the bottom of my heart. 
This isn't a scholarly message where I'm telling you something that you should know, but I don't have any, you know, information about it. Like, I couldn't tell you how to cope with divorce, right? I, I, I've not been divorced. I can only tell you from a scholarly standpoint, right? This is from personal experience of things in my life and fear that I've struggled with and had to overcome. So that's, that's what I'm sharing with you today. And so the logical side of my mind wants to attach fear to an object, right? So that I can get rid of that object, right? But that actually becomes illogical and irrational. Like if I just get rid of this thing, then I won't be afraid anymore. But that's not true. And I know it's not true, but, but the logical side of my mind wants to do that. Now, for those of you that don't experience fear like that, I would just tell you the Hebrew word shalom, peace be upon you. Don't you worry about a thing. You just sit there, we're almost done, okay? But for the rest of you, if fear is a battle that you've struggled with, hopefully this is connecting with you and you understand things. Don't attach your fear to objects or things or situations and then try to avoid those or remove those because that doesn't work. And I'm telling you from experience, I'm also telling you from someone that still has to do that. I'm walking through this with you. Isaiah 118 says, come, now let us reason together, right? Come, now let us reason together. God gave us the ability to think logically and to process things logically. Now, I will grant to you that some of us are more logical than others, okay? But he gave us the ability. And so it isn't the amount of pressures or troubles that moves the dial to panic. It's not. I want you to think about Jesus. Think about the amount of pressure and, and, and troubles and, and, and stress that he had in his life. Jesus is our goal. Jesus promises us peace in John chapter 14, 27 that I read to you. All the while, he says that we're going to have trouble. John 16, 33, right? So th those two things aren't incompatible. You're going to have a lot of stress and problems in your life. And, and the goal isn't necessarily to remove those unless there's something that they're sinful that's causing you stress and fear. Because many of the things in your life, like you know, um, paying bills, th those aren't gonna go away, okay? They're not. So it's how we process and think about the stress and our problems. That's what you need to do. Because it goes from normal you know, stresses of life to unhealthy fear and panic. And then it becomes a sin that entraps you and you get stuck in this. Now, part of God's amazing design of our bodies is he gave us this uh, hormone, like a chemical in our brain called adrenaline. And adrenaline is re released in our brain, if you remember back from high school, fight or flight, right? If there's a, a rabid dog at the end of this alley and there, there's only a six-foot wall behind you, and you have to face this dog, this is part of God's amazing design that you have adrenaline that can be released. And you could either uh, try to fight off this dog or you have uh, uh, adrenaline that can try and jump over this wall that you would never do, never, unless you had a reason to. Now, this chemical or hormone, it only lasts a few minutes. That's it. It's, and it, just like an engine runs on normal gasoline, right? There's normal things in our life that, 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 that we move around. If you're going to move around in this life, there's going to be a certain level of heat if you're alive. Certain level of heat. But this, this uh, thing called adrenaline is like nitrous in your gas tank. It's high octane. It causes your lung capacity to increase. It causes your heart rate to accelerate. And it allows us to do amazing things like lift cars off of people or outrun a threat or take on a threat, okay? But you cannot run your car on nitrous all the time. It will break down. It's not designed that way. It's a quick burst, right? And you ride that out, and then it's over. And if you think about it, a drag 
a drag race, you know, with these high octane, the cars that have the most highest octane you could put in an engine, it's a quarter mile long. That's how long a drag race is. It's over in an instant. It's not a marathon. And our bodies are the same way. Our, our bodies aren't meant to live with you processing things fearfully and, and releasing the, this hormone that's for fight or flight for things that don't require fight and don't require flight. Okay? Does that make sense? I hope it does because uh, it's too late now if it doesn't. Anyway, the Bible promises that we can change. Romans 12, 2. But here's what you need to know about change. The longer you wait to change, the longer it takes to change. However old you are, you can change. The longer you wait to change your thinking, the longer it takes to change how you think about stuff. Okay? And if you've gone your whole life with the needle going from daily pressures to instantly panic, okay, then it's time for you to undo those neural pathways and to change the way you think, right? This, this is not good. And what really upsets me as a parent when I go to schools is I see other parents that are literally training their children to panic. The things that they say to them and how they respond to just mundane things that happen in kids' lives. And they are training their kids how to panic. It is a learned behavior. I'm not, it, now it is the hormone adrenaline, right? That's something God gave us and we all have that. But you can actually learn from people and you watch them and these kids watching their parents flip out or panic about mundane things that happen to everyone. It, it upsets me. And if you're a parent that does that, don't do that. Don't do that. How you process stress is how your kids will learn to process stress. How you process stress is how your kids are going to learn to process stress. And, and I give you full, the, you have full ability. If you want to disagree with me theologically on this message, I'm okay with that. If you want to disagree with me scientifically on this message, I'm okay with that too. I don't care. This is, this is what I have to try to explain to you something that's kind of intangible or that we don't talk about. And it will take time for you to renew your mind. I want you to imagine right now that this, that we're all at a missions convention and God has called all of you to become missionaries. Everyone in here, you're called to be a missionary in a foreign land, okay? Now, we're all at this thing. Now, here's what I know. If you're called to be a missionary in a foreign country, that means that you probably have to learn a new language. Now, the older you get, the harder it will be, right? Right? because we're ingrained in, in how we talk and think now and how we process stuff. So it's going to be hard, and it will take a little bit of time. Is that accurate, if you have to learn? Okay, so because it's hard and it takes time, does that mean that God didn't call you to this foreign land? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so if I had a time of prayer and some of you come up and say, hey, can you lay hands on me and pray that God would instantly give me this language of the people that I'm going to minister to? Now, in the book of Acts, people did speak in other languages, right? They spoke in actual other languages and now we speak in heavenly languages and there's sometimes document, documented cases where people are speaking in other languages. But here's what I know. Even if you came up and you received the baptism of the Spirit, right? You don't know what you're saying, okay? So you, you can ask for this miracle to happen in your life, but that doesn't mean, oh, I need the Holy Spirit to speak to me. I got to use the bathroom, whatever country I'm in. I hope I'm saying Donde El Baño or whatever, right? <laughs> you, you, it would be foolish for you to come up to me and say, hey, I need you to lay hands on me. I need to instantly learn this new language. You know that. You know that. So here's what I know. You, you, 
are called to change the way you think and to learn a new way to think, okay? And if you are a panicker or a worrier or your life is filled with stress and anxiety, you are called to think differently. Now, being called to missions is very subjective. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians and very few missionaries that God calls, right? That's a subjective thing. Let me tell you something that's not subjective. It's 100% objective. It's for every believer in Christ. God is calling you today to transform the way you think, Romans 12, 2. And that might be hard, just like learning a language, and it might take time, just like learning a language, but he's still calling you. It doesn't take the calling away, and, and there's no prayer that's going to instantly zap all of those things that you have learned over the years. And so I hope you're not disappointed, but I don't have all the answers to rid you of your fear, but I know the one who does. Amen? Uh, there's a song on the radio called Fear is, the Lie, is a Liar. I don't know if you've heard that song, but you know, I, I like the song. It, it's true. But you know what? Fear is a very convincing liar, isn't it? I'm going to close with a couple of verses here. And we're going to uh, close singing the song that we sang at the end of worship. And I'll have the band come in just a second. Because we're going to give a time of prayer. And I know that if you come up and I pray for you, you won't be instantly zapped, right? Just like you wouldn't learn a, a language instantly. This is a process that you have to start on to change the way you think and act. And Jesus said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And if the band could come, Romans 8.11 says, the same power that conquered the grave lives in you. Think about that. The power that can resurrect a life is the same power that lives in you. John, 1 John 5, 4, we have overcome the world. Psalm 56, 3, whenever, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. If um, being delivered from fear is something that you need, the first thing to overcome is fear of coming forward. 